These drawings from the lecture notes of a course on atmospheric electricity at the University of Arizona beautifully illustrate how magnetic loop antennas are used in lightning location systems. Of course, you could use them for other purposes. For example, if the strike is close enough and the antenna is large enough, you could use a magnetic loop antenna to generate sparking capable of igniting flammable vapor. Let's say this represents a section of the shell and the floating roof of an external floating roof tank, and this represents a gap where flammable vapor may be present. If you wanted to intentionally generate hazardous sparking in this location, you could simply bond the tank shell to the floating roof with an ordinary conductor. This forms a conducting perimeter with a gap, or a magnetic loop antenna that will harness the magnetic field generated by any nearby lightning strikes and direct the energy towards the gap. And this is exactly what NFPA 780 and API 545 recommend, except instead of calling them loop antennas, they call them bypass conductors. They even recommend spacing them every 30 meters around the tank so that whether the tank is struck in the middle, on the edge, or if the strike is in the vicinity of the tank, all or a few of these bypass conductors will be well positioned to act as magnetic loop antennas. Of course, the purpose of these bypass conductors is not to intentionally blow up the tank. The actual purpose is even more ridiculous and less technically viable since it's based on a series of errors and dubious claims. Even before these bypass conductors begin to perform their claimed purpose, basically, the fire would have already begun. A lightning strike is a low probability event. Since these systems may rarely be exposed to hazardous lightning conditions, it's easy to be misled about their performance. The real question is, why do standards like API 545 and NFPA 780 make recommendations that Michael Faraday would have understood as being hazardous? 